Hi, this is the fourth lesson in the course, Digging Deeper, Studying the Bible with Integrity of Mind and Heart. This is a five-week course designed to teach some tools of both mind and heart to help you dig deeper into any individual text. We're using Hebrews 1 as our sample, but it's really, the course is really about tools. And today's topic is developing an interpretation. Um, as always, I like to begin with a song and with prayer because the Holy Spirit is our teacher. Um, I got bored with the song that I was using each week, though I think it's a good one, but I asked the Lord to give me a new song. Oh, Father, as we read your word, help us listen to all we've heard. Your word can be sharp as a surgeon's knife and a solid foundation to ground our life. Help us to walk it out, overcoming our fear and doubt. Oh, Father, as we read your word, help us listen to all we've heard. Help us listen to all we've heard. And Father, that is our prayer, that the things we learn from your word would become things that we can walk out and that become part of our life in Jesus' name. How did the homework go? Obviously, you can't answer me if you're hearing this just on the YouTube video. But once again, I want to encourage you to actually try using these tools. Because if you just listen to me, you will not gain very much from this course. The agenda to for today is to look at what's involved in interpretation and moving into application. I want to give some examples and I want to give some warnings or possible concerns. So there are a bunch of different ways that people have used to talk about um, how to go about in um, coming up with an interpretation. I've talked a lot about my Old Testament teacher, David Dorsey. This is a system, he used the acronym CIA, um, that he used specifically to talk about interpreting the law of the Old Testament, the Mosaic law. Um, he was concerned, the Bible tells us that every part of the Bible is useful for teaching, but how exactly are the Old Testament laws meant to be used and applied in our lives? He felt that this method was particularly useful. And he started it before he got to the sea. He said, as Christians, remember that the Old Testament law is not meant to be applied to us. The Old Testament law is not our law. It was written for people living in a very different situation than ours. And also when Jesus died on the cross, that old covenant is no longer the covenant that we are under. Paul explains that it's like a marriage. Um, marriage is until death do us part. The old Testament covenant law is until death do us part, and Jesus's death on the cross broke the covenant to allow us to have a different relationship with God. We are no longer under that law. So Dr. Dorsey's first suggestion was that you clarify clarify what the law meant, what its purpose was, its point in the time that it was written. Next, you look for insights about God and his ways. 
what does this kind of law in the situation it was in tell you about who God is? What does it reveal about the heart and mind of the lawgiver? And finally, if that's what God is like in light of the theological insights, what practical applications should you make in your life or could you make in your life? If this is what God cares about, what should I be caring about? Let's work through an example. So an easy one is when you build a new house, make a parapet around your roof so that you may not bring the guilt of bloodshed on your house if someone falls from the roof. Now, a parapet is a railing or a, a sort of a fence. It can be a solid wall. Um, this is written in a situation where most of the roofs were flat and where people were doing things up on the roofs of their houses. Now, I live in a house with a pitched roof and generally speaking, nobody is up on that roof. Um, if they are, they take special care in other ways, but we're not using that roof as a living space. And if we built a wall around it, that would not be helpful to anybody. That doesn't mean that this law does not have useful thoughts. If you clarify, okay, it was an important thing to help save people's lives. Insights, God cares about people providing safety to those visiting or using their property. He cares about people being kept safe by the things that we do. What are some applications? Different people have come up with different ideas. One thing in a wintry environment is that you ought to shovel your walk if people are gonna have a chance of walking on it. It matters to keep your sidewalk safe. When I uh, studied this particular law, back when I was in seminary, one thing that sprang to mind was that I had better check the fence around my swimming pool, that uh, those gates were actually functioning as they were supposed to, because a swimming pool is an attractive nuisance. And uh, if people can get in who should not be getting in, young children, for instance, I want to keep them safe. Now, you may say, well, wait a minute. That doesn't have anything to do with roofs. How can you apply the law in a way that is not directly attached to it? But look at what Paul did. He was working with an Old Testament scripture that said, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Now, the deal there was that oxen would walk in a circle while they were carrying, they were pulling a, a cart, a threshing a stone kind of thing, and it would go over the grain to set the grain free from the chaff. And every now and then, oxen would reach down and grab a bite to eat. Um, some people said, no, 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 we just wanna, we wanna save all that grain, we'll feed the ox on hay, but um, we don't want the ox eating any of the grain, so they put on a muzzle. And the Old Testament law was quite clear, don't do that. The ox gets to eat some of the grain. Um, you could apply this saying that God cares about the welfare of animals. Paul uh, used that um, to say that pastors had a right to get some pay for the work that they were doing. 
that they had a right to share in some food, in a place to sleep, and sometimes actually in, in pay. Um, is it about oxen that God is concerned? I would say, yes, it is about oxen that God is concerned, but this is written for us, says Paul, because whoever plows and threshes, and he's talking about working in, on behalf of the gospel, should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. Okay, a different way to look at the process of developing an interpretation would be Kurt Kahn's uh, version of this, he uses the acronym READS. And READS stands for read, examine, apply, dialogue, and see. Um, now what's involved in this? First to read the text, and that's exactly what we talked about in the first lesson. The idea is to really read and examine that's the tools we've been talking about in the first three lessons. He moves to apply. What has jumped out at you as you read and examine the passage? Can you write a sentence or two that starts, I, dot, dot, dot. For example, I want to trust God more fully. I want to serve more cheerfully. I want to call this or that person. Um, I want to, what might you be called to do as a result of the passage? For me in Hebrews, the action thing that I'm called to do is more a matter of praise, I think. Um, but some people may come up with something different. Dialoguing with God, it's good to do this in writing. Um, not that you have to, but it, it works better for many people if you do. You ask questions, you ask God questions, and you listen to your heart for an answer. Don't worry if it sounds like it's just your own thinking. Write it down before you think about it and evaluate it and decide whether what you've written makes sense. Um, this is a process that gets easier with time, but you will often find if you do this, if you say, God, what about this, that, or the other? Um, and then just write what comes to your mind, that there is wisdom that comes forth that seems to be deeper than what you probably have in your conscious mind. I'm inclined to think it is God speaking to us, but even if it's not, it's a useful process. C, there you're asking God, do you have anything to show me? Can you show me a picture about this passage? This gets a different sense involved. Um, and it has been used by many people over the ages. Um, this business of visualizing something can be a helpful process. Uh, this works better for some people than others, um, but it is a useful step. Another S would be state. State the truth that you've learned. Either proclaim that truth or turn it into a prayer, asking God to use that truth in your life. I did this uh, for the several verses in Hebrews 1, way back when I first uh, learned, first studied, Hebrews. Uh, a couple of checks or caveats. The Holy Spirit convicts, but the devil condemns. Which spirit is behind my interpretation? Am I reading this passage 
as something to blame somebody else or blame cast blame on myself or it's possible that yes i'm seeing something that needs to change but there's a big difference between this is wrong and you need to change and you are a bad person and god probably hates you um the devil tends to talk in that second kind of way and sometimes we talk that way to ourselves it's important if you're teaching other people to think as your last thing that you check am i preaching the good news of jesus christ or am i teaching a law am i preaching legalism uh, so here is something that I did going through Hebrews 1, 2 through 10. And I took each phrase in this passage and turned it into a prayer that kind of expounded on what had been said and that made it something that was personal to me. So in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. So what does it mean for Jesus to be the appointed heir of all things? Jesus, you are appointed heir of all things. You're the one the father chose to have it all. Keep me from grabbing, clutching things to myself. If it all belongs to Jesus, it doesn't really belong to me. In you, I have it all. Apart from you, there's nothing left to own. So that was my personal interpretation. And I turned it into a prayer. Through whom also he made the universe. What does it mean to me that Jesus made the universe? Jesus, through you, the Father made the world. The ages past, the present, and all the future there will ever be were spoken into being through you. And you made me. You knew me and planned me, held me in your heart before the beginning. The sun is the radiance of God's glory. What does that mean? What, what does it mean to me? Jesus, you are the radiance of the Father's glory, the light that shines forth from the blazing sun. Help me be a true mirror with veils and masks stripped away so that I can catch your light and shine it truly into the darkness I see the exact representation of his being. And here I looked at some of the underlying words. When we looked at the words there, there was this sense of it being like a coin or an engraving. Jesus, you are the perfect engraving of the Father's underlying essence, the exact representation of his being. I am like a coin that's blurred and fuzzy. I long to be new minted. Melt me in the fire of your love and stamp your image plainly on my heart. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. Jesus, you uphold all things by the word of your power by the spoken word that creates and brings forth life. Hold me up, Lord, hold me together and speak your powerful word into my life. After he had provided purification for sins, Jesus, you made purification of sins, cleansed, purged, made it right. The work was finished, final and complete. Completed in my heart, O oh Lord, bring your cleansing, purify my inmost being. And then Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. 
Jesus, you sat down on the right hand of the majesty of the Father. Your work was finished. You entered into your rest. Bring me, too, into that Sabbath rest, that having run the race, I may sit at your feet and worship you forever. Amen. So you see how I took each phrase and tried to say it in my own words, expand on it in ways that I felt were faithful to what the scripture said, and then take it and make it something that applied to me so that I could pray it. Here's another version of something that I wrote. Um, Again, looking just at this first part of Hebrews. Father, you have spoken to us through the prophets in portions a bit at a time. And the word that you spoke overwhelms me. Your law is so awesome and fine. You spoke to the people through angels, great creatures of wind and of fire. People shook at the visions in terror. Such fear did their speaking inspire. And now you have spoken in Jesus, not a shadow, but the brilliance of your light. The word that created the planets is spoken to us in the night. The word that holds all things together came down to destroy all our sins. When the world is changed like old clothing, the word that is Jesus will stand. A better will never be spoken. Through him you have reached out your hand. The ears that I hear with are shallow. The eyes I can see with are dim. Father, speak Jesus into my being till my life is completed in him. Amen. Now remember, poetry does not have to rhyme. In fact, when this came out and it rhymed and it had a little rhythm, I thought, oh, this is just doggerel. Now, I don't think so. I still like this poem, so I'm not so uh, ashamed of the fact that it rhymes and scans and it sort of goes da-da-da-da-da-da. Um, songs work better for rhyming, um, but it's saying it in your own words that really makes the difference. Um, I wanted to share something I recently put together. Um, one of the things that I find is helpful to me um, is to combine what I am coming up with, with pictures. That's why I make PowerPoints for these lectures. Um, we were talking about God's uh, call to come up higher, to come into his throne room. And I was really captured by the last uh, verse of, of the Song of Solomon, which is, make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. I was also captured by the, this concept in Hebrews, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. There's this sense that we now have the right to approach God's throne, um, that because of Jesus's work on the cross, we have a confidence. We are coming because of the blood of Jesus. We can come into God's very presence. And then in Revelation, um, John is having a bunch of visions and uh, he sees a door standing open in heaven and a voice says, come up here and I'll show you what must take place after this. And I thought God is calling to us to come through Jesus, through his finished work, into the presence, into that throne room. And he wants to show us things that we didn't know before. This turned into a song. I'd like to share it. Um, 
Rise up, my love, come away, my beloved. Run like a deer or a young gazelle. Rise up, my love, come away, my dear. Let us go to the mountains of spice. Come higher up, come further in into my love and away from your sin oh rise up my love come away my beloved run like a deer or a young gazelle rise up my love come away my dear let us go to the mountains of spice Come enter into the place of my throne. I have things to show you that you never know. No, rise up my love. Come away my beloved. Run like a deer or a young gazelle. Rise up my love. Come away my dear. Let us go to the mountains of spice. Let us go to the mountains of spice. Now, when I was praying about how to begin these lessons, I sat down and wrote, well, what do I want to say about the word of God? And uh, I wrote out a bunch of scriptures consider carefully what you hear um that means listen to what i'm saying in my word um for the word of god is alive and active sharper than any double-edged sword it penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit joints and marrow it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now, I could have stuck with the metaphor of a sword, but I wanted to say somehow that this is a sword that is meant for healing. And so I used the metaphor of a surgeon's knife, thinking that that was a way to deal with this in one thing. I wanted to talk about the importance of putting the word into practice um and i was thinking of the fact that jesus said the person who hears these words is like a man who builds his house on the rock this is uh you know as opposed to the one who builds his house on the sand and uh when the storm comes it falls down and i wanted to focus on this putting the words into practice so what I came up with is not taking any of these scriptures word for word, but just bringing them together into what is really an interpretation. So I came up with, oh, Father, as we read your word, help us listen to all we've heard. Your word can be sharp as a surgeon's knife and a solid foundation to ground our life. Help us to walk it out, overcoming our fear and doubt. Oh, Father, as we read your word, help us listen to all we've heard. Oh, Father, as we read your word, help us listen to all we've heard. Your word can be sharp as a surgeon's knife and a solid foundation to ground. Our life, help us to walk it out, overcoming our fear and doubt. Oh, Father, as we read your word, help us listen to all we've heard. Okay, that's all for today. Our next and last lesson is going to be about yielding to God. Um, that's actually going to be some tools to help you interact with the text. I will say in terms of yield to God, that obeying what you see is one of the most valuable tools you can possibly have 
in terms of learning to follow God and learning to understand God's word. Um, it's really all about obedience. Um, the yield to God lesson may not be so much that, but as you develop your interpretation, as you practice the tools, um, you may find that God shows you something to do. And if that is the case, do it. Step out, obey, and see what happens. I want to sing this song of blessing over all of us. He who began a good work in you. He who, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He'll be faithful to complete it. He who started the work will be faithful to complete it in you. Father, my prayer for each person listening to this is that you would indeed help us to go deeper into your word and help us to go deeper into you, whatever that means for each person. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen.